So today we have Professor Sean Handy um, talking about his now very famous COVID-19 modeling work. So as a, as a institute whose main um, forte is the computational modeling, I thought it was very, very fitting to have Professor Handy as our first Zoom seminar um, speaker. And he was very kind, despite his very busy schedule, to accept our invitation. So I will not spend any more, I will not waste any more time to introduce him because we all know who he is. So I'll just pass it on to you, Sean, so that you can start. Uh, yeah, th thank you, Vicky. I just, um, I'm gonna switch to my screen uh, shortly um, so you can so you can see my slides as I, as I talk. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's um, it was nice to, to get an invitation. Uh, was it two weeks ago, Vicky? I can't yes. remember now. Um, two weeks is a lifetime <laughs> moment. Um, and I thought this, this was a week that would be a bit more normal um, uh, for me because of the cabinet decision that was made yesterday. And certainly last week was just, was, was extremely tough week. Um, and so it's, so it's nice to be back to something that's a little bit more normal and to be able to talk to um, a few colleagues. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna. I'm, I'm not quite sure how long we'll go for, but um, I, I, I don't. I suspect I might talk for 35 to 40 minutes, something like that, and then maybe we can have questions through the chat um, yep. function. And maybe Vicky, if you were able to keep an eye on those questions, and and and, and I could work through some of those questions. Yes. Sorry, I forgot to mention in the housekeeping part. So what we will do is that people can write their questions as we go along and at the end we will choose like a top five or something like that so that um you can answer those that might be a good way to go because there are already 250 people um joining in so sure. do, do send this um question to me so that we can compile that and then have a question and answer session at the end okay well um yeah so sorry, sorry. I, 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 what I thought I'd do today is, to, is talk about both the modeling and, and then also how it's been used. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit of time to go through some of the details of, of the model, not, not, not on a huge amount of depth, but just to give you enough um, uh, of a sense of, of how the maths works. But I mean, one of the most interesting things for me is, is, has then been to, to be using this modeling um, to inform government. Um, and so I'll, I'll I'll talk you through some of the things that have been it's been very much on our mind as as we did this work. It's not like normal academic work. It's 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 quite a different thing. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. So, but let me just start by by just talking about uh, this core team. So um, Alex James, Mike Plank, Nick Stein, Rochelle Binney, and and Audrey uh, Lustig. So they've been the they've been the five people working with me on our core modelling effort. Um, you'll see later on that there's actually quite a lot of work within Te Panaha Matatini um, around COVID-19 now. There's, there's, um, there's maybe around about 30 FTE and, and, um, and TPM now working on COVID things. But these guys have been the core modelling team and there's been an enormous amount of pressure um, on this team over the last month. Um, you know, we've, we've been working 14, 15 hour days and there's been times when we've had to turn around um, results in half an hour in advance of a PM speech, um, which is both exciting and terrifying, <laughs> um, and uh, and keeps your heart rate up. <laughs> um, I've been watching my pulse rate <laughs> with my with my smartwatch, <laughs> and it's not been a good month <laughs> for. Um, uh, for my stress levels. Um, so, and, and look, this, this team has been absolutely fantastic. Um, Alex and Mike are at University of Canterbury. We're really lucky that, that Mike's been on sabbatical this semester. So he was able to drop everything and really dive into the work. Um, Alex has, um, has, has been partly on parental leave. Um, so once we were able to arrange for some uh, uh, extra uh, childcare for Alex, she's been able to dive in. Um, Nick was a student who was heading overseas to start his PhD and, um, uh, and uh, instead has been working with us. Um, and then Rochelle Binney and Audrey Lustig are two, um, two researchers that they were previously PhD students in TPM and they're now at Manaki Whenua 
um, and we were able to request them um, to come um, from Manaki Canada to come work with us on this on this core um, modeling uh, about a month ago. So I don't know how much people know about Tapunaha Matatini. Um, so we're one of the cores, one of the 10 centers of research excellence. Um, we, this is, we, we're going through our first, you know, this is our first funding cycle. So we were, we were established in, in 2015 and we've got about 70 investigators now. Um, generally our expertise, you know, it's in data and modeling, um, but mostly we've worked in, in social science um, economics and with ecological problems. So um, disease modeling isn't probably isn't one of our our core focuses, but nonetheless we have been drawn into um, into disease modeling. And I guess the most recent stuff we have done is around Embovis. So that the team um, that I just introduced you to would was at least some of those team members were involved in, in a project. Um, working with, with MPI on Embovis and using NATE data. We've also done some work on seasonal flu um, using phylogenomics and, um, and at the time we were using um, cell phone data, so cell phone location data to help us understand how the seasonal flu moved around the country. Um, and then um, we also did some work on, on Havelock North gastroenteritis uh, that was a, that was a, a, it's a different situation. We had we had a disease that that was spread through the water supply, um, but we had some experience in using bank transaction data to understand the impacts um, of that disease on the community. And, and so I guess I guess the I, the way I describe our work on diseases we, is we quite you know we do some we have done some sort of classical disease spread modelling. Um, but also we, we, we've been really interested in using sort of alternative data sources um, to try and understand disease modeling. So that's kind of how I describe what, what we'd done before. Um, and, and, you know, and, and I guess it's both tragic and interesting <laughs> that we kind of, we did this work, this seasonal flu work um, with, with the Ministry of Health's um, pandemic planning folks. Um, and then since we did that, that was, that, that was in 2016, uh, 2016 um, things have gone backwards. <laughs> um, you know, they, they, it, we, we were really keen to pursue that further and to, um, and to really try and build capability to, to use that work. And, um, but Ministry of Health kind of went quiet. Um, and we, I guess in the back of my mind, I'd assumed that they were still doing this kind of thing and they've just found some other um, folks to do that. But as we discovered sort of six weeks to a month ago, no, actually nothing had happened. Um, and in fact, we've, we've gone backwards as a country in our ability to use telecommunications data since, since 2016. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's been kind of a disappointment in a way that, that um, uh, I feel like our, our, our modeling efforts and our ability to respond to a pandemic have actually, have actually gone backwards in, in a couple of years. And anyway, so that's what we've, we've been trying to fill in those, those gaps over the last six weeks. So that just gives you a little bit of introduction to, to, to what we've done in the past and, um, and where we were starting from. So here's, this is just a sort of a, 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 a schematic overview of the types of modeling that we've been doing. Um, really, just to give you a sense of how this started, um, so Susie Wiles, um, who many of you will have, will have seen, who's in, you know, very involved in the science communication, she's one of our investigators in Te Punaha um, And And you know, we have quite a strong emphasis on science communication, which I'll talk about right at the end. And Susie's one of sort of our standout science communicators. And so early on, um, there were a couple of reasons we thought we'd, we might get involved in the modeling. Um, you know, we didn't necessarily see this as, as sort of a, a core activity for us, but we thought we could use some of the modeling to um, help communicate the science, um, to, to support the sort of things that Susie had been doing, but with a little bit more um, insight from, from the modeling. Um, but also we were just, you know, I guess we were just curious to understand the impact ourselves. I mean, I, I the very first, model we ran, I was just trying to get a handle on whether what impact this was going to have on TPN in terms of the events that we'd be able to hold this year. Um, and that work really started um, in the first week of March. 
Um, so once we were observing spread outside China, and it was pretty clear that, that um, community transmission was taking place outside China, um, that's really when we th thought, well, we'll start to do some, some modeling. Um, and so, uh, so, in, so within a couple of weeks in March, we, we basically had a, a pretty good um, deterministic SEIR model. So, if, so some of you will be really familiar with, with this type of modeling. I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide about exactly what that is and what goes into it. Um, so it's a fairly classical type of disease modeling. Um, and, it, and it's, um, you know, I guess, I guess I would say it's, it's useful for sort of understanding the, the long-term impacts of an outbreak. You might use it to look at the total proportion of the population that are, that are gonna become infected. Um, you might look at when the infection peak is going to hit. Um, you might look at some simple control measures for how you can um, potentially slow down that peak, will flatten the curve, etc. Um, and actually, it turned out that this was very similar. As we found out um, not long after we started doing this work, um, turned out this is very similar to what the um, University of Otago public health folks were doing. Um, they were actually using a model that was developed in Germany. Um, and so they weren't, I guess, we, we, we're mathematical modelers. Um, so, so we sort of build these models ourselves. And which also means, you know, which is means that we can reformulate them for different purposes. Whereas the 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 German model had really been, you know, it was it's sort of a publicly available model. And the Otago folk, um, although they've got a huge amount of expertise in the public health, they're not really modelers in the sense of being able to take um, take a mathematical model and then say reformulate that to ask a different question from which the you know the software on that which that mathematical model is based. And so I guess I guess quite early on, or, or mid March, I realised that was the case. That it, in fact, government at the moment didn't have access to what I would call mathematical modelling capability. Um, and and I guess I ha I had assumed that they did um, prior to that. But but once I realised that, then then I really made a decision to um, uh, that 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 TPM should just you know we should just really jump start. Um, what we could do, because it was apparent that that, that, that the government didn't have um, the ability to draw on um, uh, mathematical modelling. So, so one of the things we realised early on was that um, that actually this this type of model, you know, had a limited use for informing public policy decisions. It, it kind of it was useful in a sense for describing um, some very painful counterfactuals. Um, you know, such as what what would happen if we let the the disease peak, peak hit us. You know, you could look at um, uh, you know this. Oh, well, I'll talk I'll talk more in depth about that later. So we moved on, and and um, and late March we were really working with a stochastic um, model, which has some similarities to the um, to the deterministic model, but but is fundamentally the you know the, the the mathematics is is and the way the simulation is run is, is is very different, but it's more applicable to the type of situation that we that we found ourselves once the government had decided to to put in lockdown measures and especially going early into lockdown, <coughs> and so so you know it, it allowed us to to start considering the short term containment or elimination scenarios that the government has 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 effectively been making decisions on over the last month and of course that, that yesterday's decision was based on. But you can also do the long-term scenarios as well. So we, we sort of moved on to this type of model. Um, then at the same time, uh, one of the other teams, so this is, I'm not gonna talk much about this work today because it's still work in progress. Um, but one of the other teams that, that um, has been working, this is the team led by Dion O'Neill, who some people might know. So Dion's a mathematician. Um, and he'd been doing some work on, we, we were originally, the original project was um, to pull out a network, a network representation of New Zealand to study the, the diffusion of innovation in New Zealand. And so this is based on the, on the integrated data infrastructure um, through which we can get links between households, schools, workplaces, different types of businesses, different regions. And, and it, and it, it kind of gives us a coarse grain representation of how everybody in New Zealand is connected. And so we'd originally designed that to be used to understand the diffusion of knowledge and learning. Um, but, but 
you know, early on realized, well, actually, you know, that, that can be repurposed um, to, um, to look at the spread of disease across New Zealand. And, and potentially quite powerful for looking at, you know, if you wanted to segment the alert levels, if you wanted to say, and this is, this is something, this is a debate right at the moment, if you want to understand the difference between sending schools back as opposed to certain workplaces, then you need to know how, um, how doing that changes the network structure over which the disease can spread. Um, I won't t talk too much about that approach today because it, it's, you know, we're not we're not at the point of having that com that working completely yet to where we can publicly release it. Um, uh, but it caused me some very anxious moments <laughs> um, because we had to to pull out this network. Um, we had to keep our, our data lab open at the University of Auckland, <laughs> um, and so there was. A, as, as the University of Auckland shut down, we had some uh, rather anxious moments uh, trying to make sure that that data lab was kept open. We've now actually been able to extract, and, 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 and I should say we're not extracting the actual network, we're, we're extracting a pseudo network um, that has the same net, network characteristics um, as New Zealand. Um, but we did manage to do that um, uh, at the last moment, and so we, we, we now have that network representation of New Zealand. So that's kind of that's the that's the history um, of of what what we've done, um, and we, we expect to be able to be providing, you know, both these models we've we've been providing to to, to government. Um, we've largely retired this SEIR model now, so we're not we're not really using it. Almost everything we're doing at the moment that's provided to government is based on the stochastic model, um, and then from probably next week to early the, the week following we'll, we'll be using this network model to um, inform decisions about segmenting lockdown policies so let me just talk about how these SEIR models work if some of you will know more about this than me um, hi Sean and, just to just yep. let you know that you want to you might want to put it in your presentation mode you would sure um, yeah that me, might. yeah okay okay, okay thanks um, uh, so, so um, yeah, so, so, so basically this is, these are deterministic models um, based on a set of rate equations. Um, you know, they're often called compartment models because they describe the movement of individuals um, or proportions of your population between different compartments, right? And those compartments are based on an epidemiological view of the disease. Um, you know, they're very simple models um, you can get uh, you, you can do quite a bit with them analytically. Um, uh, we, we've, we've, been, we've been using more complicated models. You can do a little bit of analytic work with, with these, um, but we've been solving them numerically. Um, you know, you start off, the, your population is susceptible, right? When it comes to COVID-19, because it's the first time we've encountered the disease um, or this, this virus, right? We're, we're all susceptible. Um, and so the population starts over in this compartment um, and a certain proportion per time, right, given by some rate, move into this exposed category, right? And, and then the, the, basically um, we have people moving out of the susceptible cap category, right? So that's this ordinary differential equation, right? And it basically depends on how many susceptible people encounter um, people who can infect them, right? And in this particular model for, for, for COVID, um, people are infectious before they are symptomatic. Okay, then now there's still there's still a fair bit of uncertainty about the um, you know precisely how infectious you are when you're pre-symptomatic, um, and you know over the time that that over which you're pre-symptomatic and infectious. But nonetheless, we have to consider. Um, that you know that you're infectious before you're pre-symptomatic, and this is one of the this is one of the reasons that actually COVID is is very difficult to control is because of this particular compartment. And um, for example, with with SARS, um, you know the the people were generally um, uh, symptomatic when they were infectious, right? But anyway, there's this category here, and there's some you know there's some um, rate at which people move from exposed through to pre-symptomatic. Right, and then there's a rate at which you move through to infectious. Now, in our original model, and we never really used this, um, so this is a bit of unnecessary detail. Whoops. Um, 
we uh, we had people we were we were thinking we would look we need to include testing um, in the model and so actually you you could be infectious you, that meant you might have go, got to, gone to go get a test and it might have been confirmed that you were um, you had the disease and you might be isolated you might be self isolated at that point right and so we have these two compartments um, and of course people who are not tested and infectious. Um, are more likely to pass that disease on to others, right? Whereas if you're isolated, uh, maybe you'd be less likely to pass that disease on to others. So we had these two compartments. We actually never really did this because we moved quickly on to the, um, onto the stochastic model um, rather than um, playing with this. But then of course, you know, once, once you've got the disease, you've moved to infectious, a proportion of people are going to, to, um, to die from the disease. Um, and so that depends on this, this number, the um, infection um, fatality um, rate, um, and some people recover, um, and you know whether you're tested or not, right? So, so there's, an, there's, there's this final compartment. In the SEIR models, you assume these people um, have some immunity, right? And so eventually, what brings the, the disease to a halt in, the, um, in the, this model is that herd immunity develops, right? And so, Initially, you have a lot of susceptible people, and so you get that exponential um, growth um, as, as people move into infectious. But then, eventually, enough people have uh, immunity have immunity uh, because they've recovered. That that now infectious people aren't encountering susceptible, more susceptible people, and so the, the 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 peak starts to fall off. One thing that we did in our model um, was we tried to capture. Um, particularly when we're looking at the at the um, uh, at, at, at recovery and um, and fatality, we tried to capture the, a little. Uh, we had a very simple model of of um, the hospital dynamics. Of course, one of the things with this disease is is if you get a severe enough um, uh, case, then um, then you need ICU um, care, and you know you need ventilation in a in a, a intensive care unit. Um, and so we had a very simple model of intensive care capacity. Um, so basically, there was an infection um, fatality rate uh, that applied, provided that ICU wasn't wasn't overloaded. But if ICU was overloaded, um, then people would die at a, at a higher rate. We were basically assuming that that uh, that you you die at a significantly higher rate. Um, once ICU capacity became saturated. And that was actually one of the reasons that, I don't know if you followed the Otago models, that was one of the differences between our model and, and the Otago model is, um, is we, we took a little bit more care over trying to understand what happens when, um, uh, when ICU capacity is, uh, is oversubscribed. So, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a plot from um, the paper that we publicly released. So this is the sort of thing that we started sending to government um, from about mid-March. Um, and so we were, we were sort of back and forthing with, with, with government at this point with, that, with our model. Um, and you know, a lot of that was trying to, them trying to understand why we were getting different results to the Otago model. Um, and I think that caused a few people to, to lose some sleep in the ministries as why well, are these models giving different answers? <laughs> so I'll talk about that a little bit later. But we basically explored with you know this blue curve, right? So the reproduction number. So um, so the re this reproduction number depends on some of the, the parameters in the SEIR model um, that uh, uh, that we were looking at before. It's a, you, you can get that out analytically. Um, and so this, re but this reproduction number, the, the kind of the the, the reproduction number um, without any controls on um, is estimated to be something like, <clears throat> excuse me, to be something like two and a half to three. Um, and so this the blue line here, right? That's just the uncontrolled um, spread of the disease through through New Zealand. Right? Here's our estimate of hos hospital capacity down here, right? And you can see that very early on. Um, hospital capacity is exceeded, uh, and in fact, at peak, you know, something like 15% of the of the population are infected, 
that's hitting, if I look down here, sometime in August. Um, and, and so that's a pretty catastrophic outcome for the country. Um, if you put population-wide suppression measures on, so control measures on, so go and put people into lockdown, right? Depending on how strong that lockdown is, right? You might um, flatten the curve, um, which which also delays the curve. So this is a this is us looking at, at some population-wide controls, and we, and we've said, okay, what what happens if we can bring that reproduction rate uh, reproduction number down to 1.75? Right, then we, we flatten the curve, we probably about halve the, the size of the peak, um, we've spread it out and we've delayed the curve um, into, into um, spring sometime. Okay, if we, if, we put a re if we put really drastic controls on, right, and we, and we extend these controls for a long period of time before we relax them, so maybe you're prepared to do this for a long period of time to wait for a vaccine, right, then you can keep the disease under the, the ICU capacity, but as soon as you let the brakes off, right, if you don't have a vaccine, right, then um, uh, then you get hit with another wave. If you can keep the reproduction number below one over that time, right, then you can keep the numbers down um, for quite a while, right, but eventually that, that wave comes back and hits you because you haven't got um, herd immunity once you relax that control. Okay, so this was this is sort of I guess this, these were these were the sort of suppression strategies that people were talking about. Um, we were asked to look at these mitigation type, these kind of on-off mitigation strategies quite early on. Um, so this this is this is where um, because you don't think you can keep the very strong control measures on for 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 a long time, and of course if you've if you've been listening to the debate about this. Um, just over the last couple of days, and you've probably got opinions yourself about how we should be doing these these controls. Um, then you realise that that you know there's quite a lot of um, you know it's quite difficult from an economic point of view to, and social point of view to keep these controls on for a long time. So these were scenarios where we looked at what happens if you if you put the control you know you wait till you hit ICU capacity, right, and then you put the strong controls on, right, and then you can have a break. And then you put the strong controls on again. And so, when the prime minister was talking about breaking the wave, right, she was looking at curves like this um, to think about potential strategies for having contr lockdown controls that could be put on and taken off, and and that was used to inform that alert level um, uh, structure. Okay, now I am taking longer than I thought would thought thought on this. I'm spending too much time describing the models to you. Um, I will, this is our stochastic model, so I'll probably take a little bit um, longer going through this, which means I'm not going to get to the policy stuff, but, uh, oh, well, you're pro probably interested in the models anyway, and I can whiz through the policy stuff. So, look, we, we you know, it, it became clear once we'd gone into, into lockdown that, you know, especially once we'd seen the, the, the peak of um, imported cases um, start to, to die away, um, that we were in an elimination contamination uh, containment um, scenario. And so we needed a stochastic model to look at that, right? We've got small numbers um, and, uh, and in those SEIR models, you know, we can't really look at elimination and, and containment um, becomes quite an artificial um, uh, thing to look at in those models. So we moved on to the stochastic model. It's based on a, a, a branching process model. Um, and there was a there is a model in the UK that that um, that was similar, um, which gave us some reassurance that this was this was a useful model. Basically, you st we start with you know we seed our model with some infected cases. Um, so when we run the model, we usually we're we're, we're seeding with known um, cases. Um, so whether the international cases that have that have come back, so people caught the disease overseas and have come back, um, uh, or otherwise. Right, and and basically there's a there's a Poisson distribution that de, that describes how many people this individual is going and in, in the individual based model is going to go on and infect, right? Um, based and and I'll I'll show you how this is computed on the next slide. And actually, there's kind of two categories of of, of individual, two categories of of infection. We have because there is a very wide uh, range of um, 
of presentations of clinical presentations of of the disease of course you know some people have very mild symptoms some people um, don't um, un are unaware that they have the disease so we have a category that's called subclinical so this is where these are these are people that, that basically don't know they've got the disease um, the symptoms aren't strong enough um, and then we have clinical cases so this is the remainder of people um, and and so there's a portion of the of you know the people you go on to infect will develop the subclinical cases or clinical cases. Um, there's a time, of, there's a generation time, right? If you're generating this, this next um, uh, set of cases in the population, right? And that generation time is described by our Weibull um, distribution, which, which is um, uh, based, related to a stretched exponential type of distribution, right? And then we just propagate this model forward. Um, subclinical cases, um, and uh, we assume have some sort of reduced infectivity, right? So they've got a different reproduction number, um, uh, and then uh, clinical cases have a have a have a different type of um, uh, also have a different um, uh, reproduction number that's closer to the to the uh, clinical. But there's a little bit more subtlety to than that, right? So here's the here is the mean infectivity, right? It's a it's a plus one distribution. Um, we put in some herd immunity. Um, uh, so that we can describe, because the, that branching process model doesn't naturally include herd immunity, um, but we can put in that herd immunity by just assuming that it's developing over time as people re recover. Um, we, we can put in population-wide controls. So this basically re re reduces the mean infectivity um, by some fraction, right? That depends on the, on, on the alert level that you're putting in, right? We, we, we do case isolation. So this is where via contact tracing or testing, people are actually going into isolation. So you have reduced infectivity um, once you're in isolation, right? And here's where the, um, the, the Weibull um, uh, distribution is appearing, right? And we might have a distribution that looks like this, um, where you become infected. There's some period before um, you're isolated at which you have a higher infectivity. So you're gonna generate more, um, uh, tend to generate more secondary infections in this period. Then once you get isolated, you've got a reduced infectivity, um, and eventually, whoops, eventually you um, uh, you are either hospitalised um, or um, or uh, which may lead to um, fatality, or you recover. Right. So that's sort of a schematic of a typical infection curve for an individual. Um, yeah. So so one. So an important feature of this model is, is, is the idea of case isolation, right? So this is where public health, um, uh, uh, individual public health controls matter, right? So there's some time um, at which you'll develop symptoms, right? T1, so this is, this is, a, this is a random variable. Um, you'll develop your symptoms and then, and then you've got to go get your test. Um, and you'll go get your test, and then you'll go into into isolation, right? And once you once you're isolated, um, you know there's some period from that test to from the onset of symptoms to your um, uh, to when you're isolated, right? And we actually take this number from real case data, okay? So we've um, we 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 have um, detailed case data from um, from ESR and Ministry of Health, so we can actually get this empirically. Um, and actually, I think at the moment this this number is negative, um, which which reflects the fact that we're, that the, we've got those numbers down so small, and the testing is now in advance of the uh, um, of developing symptoms thanks to the um, contact tracing, um, and so we, we we're drawing on real data there. And then, so sort of one of the most difficult things is is, is sort of assessing these population wide controls. And so what we've been doing, whoops, um, is we've been looking at overseas. What, what sort of measures have overseas countries um, had, right? So where people, where countries have gone into strong lockdown, how much has that reduced their effective reproduction number, right? And then we choose our, our, this, this control function C to sort of give us reproduction numbers that are, that are equivalent to those we're seeing overseas. Um, and we categorize those into realistic and optimistic. Okay, and I'm actually gonna skip over this because I'm going way slower than I thought. But you know, there's 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 some details of the model. Just other features before I sort of go into some of the results. Other features of the model, um, we also have underreporting. Um, so this is this is where 
uh, there are maybe parts of the country or people in diff diff different ethnicities or different socioeconomic conditions that might have poor access to healthcare. Um, and so they might be less likely to, to go get a test or less likely to be able to go to their GP and say I'm ill. Um, we have super spreading events, um, which reflects some of the stuff we've seen in some of those, the clusters. Um, we've got regional structure um, with interregional travel. Um, and then we've now got age and ethnicity structure for the infection fatality ratios. Okay, and I just mentioned this, that, you know, in particular, um, and there's a, there's a couple of ways we've gone about doing this, but, um, but Māori and, and, and Pacific people have much higher risks um, of, of fatality. Um, uh, and you can either, you can look at this a couple of ways. You can look at, um, at, you look at life expectancy um, and, and, and try and adjust on that basis to, to, to data on infection fatality rates overseas. Um, or you can look at comorbidities. Um, so these are other conditions that people might have um, that appear to, to, um, to impact on, um, on your chances of surviving the, the disease. Um, so that's a paper that came out last week looking at that. So what do these, what do these results look like? Well, it's a stochastic model. So we run it a hundred or a thousand times. Um, you know, here's a short term example. Um, the red line is, are the reported cases. Right, and then the blue line is is the actual number of cases that we're observing. Um, here's a scenario where we've been in lockdown level four, and we're coming out this week, right? And you can see um, that the, you know, the number of of, of cases starts to um, starts to rise, and 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 that becomes evident quite quickly. Um, or you know, and here's the long term outcome, right? So they, these look similar to those those SEIR curves, right? So if we come out of lockdown, um, we go bang and we've, you know, we've, we've just, we've flattened the curve, but we've pushed it out till, and pushed it out till spring. Okay, some of the assumptions in here. So this is where it gets, this is where it gets really interesting talking to policymakers. Um, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to think about the model structure and, and, and how the structure of your model might um, influence the uncertainties. There's a lot of uncertainty in clinical and, and public health parameters, um, where we, you know, we we can, we can understand we can understand as modelers that there are uncertainty in those, but we can't necessarily make the best judgments about what numbers we should be putting in or what's a reasonable range for those. Um, this is the stuff that drove me crazy. Was, um, you know, everybody's asking me for, let's, can you run this model and tell us what's going to happen? But then we had no idea what, you know, we had to say, well, you've got to tell us what policies you're going to put in place <laughs> for us to run the model, right? That actually has a big, um, uh, that has a big outcome on, on the uh, results of the model, big influence on the outcome of the model, sorry. And then how effective are these alert levels going to be? And so, um, and so those are all things that um, are difficult to know. You know, here's the types of things that we've been producing for policymakers. Um, some graphs like this went into um, went into the cabinet paper that the cabinet were looking at over the weekend. You know, here's an optimistic scenario. We've got op optimis optimistic um, population-wide controls, fast case isolation. That that adds up to give you an R effective of about 0.65. Um, and you know, in this scenario, we keep the controls on um, till we eliminate. So sometime in June, late June. We actually eliminate the disease in most of the simulations. Whereas here, what have we got? Right, we come out after six weeks, right? And what we've done is um, coming out after six weeks is we've just contained, right? So, so, it, so the disease is still present in most of our simulations. Um, you know, I kind of, I've had to work up a way of communicating some of these uncertainties to policymakers. Um, I actually won't go through those now since since I'm eating through my time. I might just talk about the workflow that we've developed um, to try and to try and do this to try and um, mitigate some of those uncertainties. Right, we've got we've got our core model development team, and then we've set up specialist peer review panels. So we've got an ethics peer review panel, we've got a um, epidemiology um, peer review panel, and we've got a methods peer review panel. And so our models go through these panels on roughly a weekly cycle. Um, and that just kind of, you know, that's acting as, you know, we're not submitting these to journals, right? That would 
you know, we, we can't use normal academic peer review, but that, that just helps us ensure that we're not making mistakes um, and that we're thinking correctly about the models. We've got policy review happening. So, um, so usually the policy people are getting sort of early looks at, at the modeling. And now that a lot of that is for, is for them to say, okay, well, we really need, that's fine. That's great from a modeling perspective, but really need you to be asking these questions. Um, and then to try and deal with this kind of two broad brush needs, right? There's operational needs. So we have um, the army, the police, um, the hospitals all asking us how many patients we're going to have. Um, are we going to have to put roadblocks up um, on this region, right? And so we've developed a process to, to come up with what we call working scenarios. So these are sort of scenarios that everybody's agreed um, we're going to hold in place for the for operational purposes, right? So that we're not confusing anyone. Obviously, the government can change its mind <laughs> about these, and of course, the cabinet had its big decision yesterday which means we'll now need to update all these working scenarios based on the decision that was made yesterday. But then there's an awful lot of what if, right? Okay, can you tell us if we extend to, to after Anzac Day, um, Anzac Day weekend, what's the impact there, right? And so that a lot of that is coming from policy people. Right? Then we've been publicly releasing the material. Whoops, sorry, publicly releasing the material. Um, <laughs> that's had some very interesting, I mean, it, you know, I think it's been important to do so, so that people, there's transparency around the modeling that people, um, around the decision making. Um, but it's also meant that we've got this enormous number of people creating third party tools using our models. Um, and that's been a bit of a headache because they're usually using an old model <laughs> that, um, that um, you know, that say we're no longer supporting or is no longer fit for purpose for the, for the current environment. So a lot of people took our SEIR model and have put it in third party tools. Um, and then trying to sell, sell it back to the government in some way. Um, so that's been kind of interesting to experience. Here's the whole program that we're doing. Um, uh, we've got, you know, I've mostly been talking about this bit, the mathematical epidemiology. I talked a little bit about the network stuff. We've also got some people, um, so, so people, um, including some of your colleagues in engineering, um, Michael Sullivan, Elsa Zedens, Cam Walker, who are working on, on more detailed models of, of hospital systems. Um, there's a big load of work going on the follow dynamics. So that's trying to use the, um, the genomic data from the, the virus itself to understand spread. We've got a program looking at disinformation spread. So this is more like our typical piece of work that we do, looking at um, dis disinformation and how it's spreading through New Zealand and compared internationally. And then again, there's a program looking at the social and economic impacts of the disease and on the controls that are being put in. Again, that's more typical TPM uh, type work. Um, I just wanted to talk, I just to finish up, I mean, it's been really, it's been a really interesting experience um, being sort of, <laughs> I mean, um, the, the, my experience has been, has been, you know, it's been very unusual. Um, I was actually seconded on a Friday afternoon um, by the police. <laughs> um, me and one other person from Statistics New Zealand, we got this very strange email um, basically saying that, that it was issuing us a lawful order to start working for the government. It took me all week, it was a Friday afternoon, I was having beer o'clock at that point, um, and took me all weekend to work out what had happened re reading this email. Um, but but since then, so that's, that's about three weeks ago, I've, I've actually been working within government. Um, and it's been, I've had to use all my um, understanding of how policy works. I mean, I, I, I feel like TPM has been quite well prepared for this because we've done a lot of working with central government and we have a lot of relationships. Um, you know, we've had relationships with, with Juliet Gerard's office. We've had relationships with Treasury, with Statistics New Zealand. We've had to build some new ones. Um, so we've now got relationships with DPMC, Ministry of Health and ESR. But, but, you know, I think that was actually a key part of us being able to deliver this stuff in a way that was, was useful, was actually having a lot of experience um, in working previously with central government and, um, and not just with one part of central government, um, uh, you know, with, with both policy and operations. And then I think the, the other part of it um, has been communication. I think that's been hugely important. I mean, this is really what started it all was Susie Wiles 
um, and the amazing work that she's done as a, as a science communicator. It's just, just been astounding to see the impact she's had. Um, but this is actually, you know, we've, we've sort of built this function in, into to Punaha Matatini. So a lot of people who work in TPM have experience working with journalists um, and mainstream media outlets and also vice versa. Those mainstream media outlets have a lot of experience of working with us. Um, and so that kind of trusted uh, working environment has been really important. Very early on, we, we've partnered with both New Zealand Herald and, and Spinoff to do data visualizations. You know, we're quite active on, on social media channels, which has been really useful for getting this stuff out. And so this has been an important part. You know, we've not just been drawing on our modeling expertise, we've been drawing on our experience working with policy and, and with, um, with working with um, uh, uh, the media and, and, and science communication. Um, look, I'm conscious that we've, there's probably a few questions that have lined up in the chat. Look, I, I, I have talked to you a little bit about the, um, the network um, and agent-based models that we're doing, so I probably won't go through that again. And I've, I've, I mentioned on that bigger program that we're working on disinformation and patient flow as well, so I'll just skip that. And just to, just to summarise, you know, to be able to do this, I mean, it was really, if you told me six weeks ago that we, what we would have done, I, you know, I would have really struggled to think that, that this was possible or, or likely. But there, I think there have been a few things. There's been a lot of lessons for me, and it's, it's been quite vindicating, I think, as well, in terms of the way we set up to Punaha Matatini and the way that the core works. You know, because you might be tempted just to simply write down, just to say, well, what, 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 what are the things that, that, that the research community can provide to government? Well, obviously, it's modelling capacity and capability. Um, uh, and so those were things we do have and, and, and we have built through, through core funding. But you, you could do that through MB funding. You could do it through lots, you know, through national science challenges. You know, I think, I think what, might, what might be particular to TPM, though, is because of the sort of transdisciplinary approach we've taken to working, um, is that we've, we're really used to working with a wide variety of data sources, right? We're, we're, we've done stuff with telecommunications data, we've done stuff with banking data, um, we work with, with, um, with data around communications, we work with networks, and so actually that was, that was something I think you'd probably, I don't know, it feels like something we, we, that was quite unique to us. But then also, yeah, our focus on, on, um, on working with policy, you know, we've very consciously as a core built very strong relationships with policymakers and a lot of our investigators have an understanding um, of how to work with policymakers. And I think, I think that would, that's often a challenge in the research sector. And again, I think, I think was something that, that, that we brought to the table that was useful. And then again, that science communication capability was really important. Um, to be able to do what, what we've done. We've, has to, we've had to have people who can go um, and, and talk um, you know, to a national audience uh, uh, about this work. I think, and this is something that a lot of cores will have, is just the agility of a core structure. I mean, er, very early on, I approached um, the SIFTI Science Challenge, and they just don't have the flexibility to be able to do this kind of thing. You know, they're, they're, they're set up to work in a different way TPM was able to respond really, really um, quickly to that. And we've, bought, we've built a really close network of people in TPM um, over, over this, this five and a half years. And so there's a lot of trusted relationships, which means people are prepared to work around the clock for each other. It means people are prepared to, you know, some people are prepared to go do the communication, others can focus on the modeling. Um, and actually that works really seamlessly because people know each other and trust each other. And I just think it, you know, final point, you know, a bit of a pitch, you know, obviously, obviously the cause, we don't know <laughs> where everything is at in the core selection round. It's, it's just really, it's, it's crazy that, that, that this is happening at the same time as we've, as we've been going through a core selection round. Um, but I think it does show the value of, of taking transdisciplinary approaches to cause. And we're not the only core that, that does this. Um, but I think this will be uh, you know, this 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 will be at the end of the day a a, a validation of um of 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 cause and the way that we do things. Okay, so um, I'm going to switch back to my camera. Um, 
and see if we've got any questions. And I can see I can <laughs> I can see people telling me to put it in full in full screen mode. So <laughs> I've eventually got around to doing that. Um, Thanks very much, Sean. That was that was fantastic. Yeah. I do have a few questions. Um, um, but, uh, before before Ruben before we can um, sure. we can start with um, Peter's question because it's ABI seminar. Yeah. Um, sure. <laughs> so um, Peter, you can um, start asking your question that you sent me through. Okay. Um, Peter here, Sean. Thanks very much. Hi, Peter. For very lucid explanations and great, great to see the big picture of following all the way through to policy. Um, I'm just wondering, have you looked at or do you know of other groups that have looked at the issue of dealing, modelling the person-to-person -person infection that takes into account exposure time, distance apart, viral load, coughing behaviour, individual susceptibility? <laughs> Etc. It just seems it might become important when we need to understand the risk of opening up certain types of venue where people interact in different ways. So more yeah. of tuning some of the parameters you use, but on a more person-to-person, -person, particular environment basis. Yeah. Um, so, I, so I don't think so, Peter. So I know I know you you, you guys have got in touch a, a little bit about that work. I mean, the, the closest we've come to sort of really dipping our toes into that at this at this stage is the issue around schools. Um, and you know, should you should you reopen schools? And and it's and it's really hard to know <laughs> um, because the clinic the, the, there's so little information. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's 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 an absence of evidence about that um, and and so you, you know the, I think the director general has taken a particular you know the director general of health Ashley Bloomfield has taken a particular posi position and I would describe that as an absence of evidence as an e as evidence of absence <laughs> um, uh, versus you know someone like Michael Baker who was you know kids are just great at spreading <laughs> respiratory viruses <laughs> we should not assume <laughs> that an absence of evidence means that the, you know the, the child to child transmission is, is is unlikely so it's quite a lot of the clinical data is quite sketchy around that um and that we i i think that's that that is where so the I, abi could be really good at you know um at, at potentially doing some modeling to to, to back that up and I know the approach that you guys were thinking of, you know, with, with kind of that sp spatially explicit um, uh, uh, a ABM type work that you were talking about could be really useful. I mean, I'm, I've no doubt people are doing this somewhere. What, <laughs> you know, there's, there's, I don't know, almost every modeling group in New Zealand is doing something, <laughs> as, as I've learned. Um, but I think, I think that's somewhere that, that um, we, we, you guys could add value, um, particularly if you're building, you know, Trying to understand that the um, I think there's yeah there's just a, there's a huge there's a huge lack of clinical information um, uh, about that and and yeah I, c I could certainly see you guys helping to fill that gap. Okay, thanks. No doubt, plenty of other questions. We have heaps of other questions here. Um, one question um, that we have is. Um, how did you get an, an accurate estimate of the constant in your um, SEIR model, like alpha, gamma, and uh, others? That's one of the questions that we got first. Yeah, so so um, so we just been, we've been following um, uh, our work uh, overseas, and we've had a we've had a um, a peer review panel that has help, helped us do that. So um, we we put together a group of. Um, a, a, People who are a mix of epidemiologists, mathematical epidemiologists, um, and some some people who um, are linked into the work done overseas. So we worked, you know, because there's a normal there's if you go look at the literature, you know, <laughs> there's a very <laughs> wide range of things you can find in the literature. And so we put together that panel to help us do that. So we went through a cycle um, with the SCI model of putting those numbers to those groups and 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 then refining. And so we sort of ended up with something that everybody was 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 comfortable with, um, and 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 also, you know, those the the, the best things in the literature changed over time rapidly early on when we were doing that. Um, so we've now stopped that with the SEIR models. So we haven't been updating our SEIR models. So we I think we published our last parameter set on our website um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that was our last best guess, I think. But we haven't 
you know, if you want to use that, you know, some people that feel free to go use that parameter set, just bear in mind um, that, uh, that we haven't been updating that since, right? Because we've moved on to the stochastic model. Um, and so those, those, that panel has been looking at our stochastic model um, since. But that was, you know, that was a really helpful process for us. Um, uh, and, and so I, I'd advise, you know, people, people are doing that. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're wanting to run one of those models, get, getting some good peer review in place or some people who can advise you on that. And you know they won't necessarily all be modelers either. But we had <clears throat> so we had people like Mick Roberts. Some people will know Mick Roberts. He he really specialises in those kind of deterministic SCIR models, and he's really well plugged into the international community. And so he was he was a you know he was he was someone who was very helpful through to someone like Michael Baker, who's really a sort of a, a more hands-on public health expert um, who was who but is also very well connected internationally and can point us to um, what he thought were the most trusted sources um, for the inputs into those models. Mm. Okay, so another question is about the um, NI, NHI numbers. So we all have NHI numbers and then, but we also have the um, DHP that has the medical records separately. So in your experience as a modeler, how well do these databases interact and how readily <laughs> well has the data been for your modeling purposes? That's a really interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay, the, 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 I can't be complete. I know we're recording. <laughs> if we weren't recording, I'd tell you some very funny stories <laughs> about this. And maybe, maybe after this is all over, I can talk a bit more about this. It's been really hard um, in, in the end. Um, and there's still gaps in what we're doing. But in the end, what we're getting is a daily feed from, um, from ESR. Um, and we're getting... Um, we are getting the NHI number, um, we're getting mesh block uh, uh, address, um, or, or mesh block level location for the for the patients, and 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 we're getting some I don't know patchy patchy clinical information about about the individual patients, um, which fills in and over time. It has been a massive headache. Because, of course, a lot of that, you know, we're still not getting good information about negative tests. Um, so, so we still have to do it. We still have to make some guesses about, <laughs> for example, how many tests are being done in Tairawhiti. Um, and uh, so, so, so that system's still far from perfect. If people, so, so, um, so we, can, um, we can share some of this information with people uh, through a Stats New Zealand data sharing agreement. Um, so I know I know there'll be some people here who might be interested in getting um, some access to some of that data, um, and it may it may not be the the, the unit record data, um, but it could be aggregated in some way for for people's use. So um, don't all I know there's a lot of people online. Don't all hit me up for that data in the next hour. <laughs> um, but um, but we have been we have been sharing um, uh, uh, that you know aspects of that data with other with other groups. Mm, yeah so but it's, 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 it's definitely been a headache and um and it really it really took um a lot of jumping up and down to 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 make that start working and uh, and of course it's still not working perfectly mm -hmm. okay well just time passes so um maybe i have to pick and choose one or two questions is it okay to go a little bit longer okay great so one of the questions um um Funny, uh, I thought that's kind of um, what we were all um, thinking of. What do you think that we have a reasonable hope of elimination? Because do you have that we have a reasonable chance of eliminating the disease? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, I, you know, this is, um, obviously I get asked this on TV all the time. Like the scenario, okay. So the scenarios we ran for cabinet um, on Friday or very late night, at a very late night on Thursday, running these scenarios, we looked at the, we looked at what happens if we exit level four this week. What happens if we exit after the Anzac Day weekend, and then what happens if we have a two week um, exit? And and our, and our the stochastic model, we were eliminating. Um, and that, okay, and this depends on how good we think level three is going to be. And actually, the government I think has opted for a very fairly strong level three. So if we've got a strong level three, then actually 
you know, that actually makes it fairly likely we'll, we'll eliminate, um, to, you know, and that, obviously that depends on how long we stay in level three. Um, if, we, if, if we've got a weak level three, then I think our simulate, you know, what we, what we assessed as being a weak level three, you know, we, if we'd stayed in two weeks, we had a 50-50 chance of eliminating. I mean, so I'm, and, and overall, we've been, um, we've been too pessimistic so in advance. And so, you know, we've been updating um, as, as we've observed the, the response to the lockdowns. Um, and, and over time, we've become more optimistic. So our pessimistic, our realistic, and our optimistic scenarios have all become more optimistic. So I'm, fa I'm fairly optimistic. Um, and now we're shifting to, like in terms of the modeling work, what we're shifting to now is, um, is, is all around surveillance and containment, should we have an outbreak. Um, and as, as I've said, with the small numbers we have at the moment, the, the contact tracing, the, you know, the, the speed to, to case isolation is actually very fast at the moment. Um, and so, so that should give us some reassurance that despite the fact that yes, the contact tracing system has been built on the fly and is still fundamentally fairly archaic, you know, we don't have some of the flash toys that they do overseas yet. Um, you know, it's, it's still actually operating very effectively in the current environment. Um, and so the big risk I would say is parts of the country where we, where we don't have, where people don't have good healthcare access Right? If, there, if there is disease spreading in, in, um, in parts of the country where we don't, we, you know, where people don't, aren't going to the doctor, aren't getting tested, um, can, once we do discover that, can we, do we have the surge capacity to come in and deal with that? The good thing is that those parts of the country are probably um, the more, the easier to isolate, right? You know, so it is going to tend to be the parts of the country that are more isolated. Um, so we've got an opportunity to contain it. I mean, the bad news is that, of course, those are also communities that are poorer, um, more likely to be Maori, um, and, and of course, that an outbreak there would have much worse consequences from a public health perspective. So, so yeah, yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I mean, I do think I do think we're on, a, on an elimination pathway still. Great, great to hear that. Um, so one last question is from our Paul Nielsen. He asks, how important was TMS's communication expertise in getting the government to trust your predictions through quantitative modeling? How was that? Yeah, that's a very interesting one. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's I, I, look, we, I, I should give a lot of credit to Juliet Gerard, um, who's the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor in town, who's the, um, the chief science advisor at Ministry of Health. Um, they have been absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, we all owe them a huge debt of gratitude for the work they've done on behalf of the science community. Um, you know, they, they've, they've made it possible to do what we've done, I think. I think it, it, it also helped in a funny way, right? The, 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 there's a lot, I think, if you, if you sort of... Let's broadly categorise the people in government who are more sceptical of what we've done. It's it's around the economics <laughs> side of things, right? <laughs> so very early on, um, I was aware that 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 you know Treasury there was a degree of scepticism going around Treasury around the epidemiological modelling, um, and I think the fact that that actually TPM that's traditionally where we've worked a lot with. So we actually. Which you know we were trusted by that community um, meant that the fact that we were doing it actually helped. Um, you know, interestingly enough, Treasury actually have versions of our model running. They didn't talk to us, <laughs> but we found out eventually that they were running. They'd basically built their co copies of our model, um, and, uh, and and are now running those models and they're now using them in their analysis. And the, and again, that was. I think that was probably the fact that they were independently doing that. Um, and, and that's because we put it out publicly, right? They didn't come to us. Um, and we, frankly, we didn't have time to, to transfer the models over to Treasury. But because we put it out publicly, they were able to build them. They were able to reproduce our work and understand it. Um, and that, that, I think, has meant that the economic ministries, who are potentially a source of scepticism around the epidemiological modeling, have been, have been less so. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, well then, time's already 
12.40, so we might have to uh, wrap this up. But thank you again so much, Sean, for spending your time with us, explaining your model. It's more a lot more clearer as what we, we have used and then have a lot more confidence uh, in, your, in your outcome. So hopefully moving towards uh, level three and level two, um, we hopefully we will we'll be able to el eliminate this COVID-19 together. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, so this video will be made available through uh, ABI's uh, YouTube channel. So I will send the, um, the link to the video through the usual uh, email um, advertisement. Thank you. Thank you for coming again and I will see you, see you next time. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye.